All right, welcome back, marine biology students. Today, we're gonna to talk about animals, our first lecture on animals, and particularly, this is gonna be what we call invertebrates, animals that don't have a backbone. So, first of all, let's talk about, well, how do we define what an animal is? And you, you think about dogs, or people are animals, or monkeys, um, you know, if you think about typical animals you're familiar with, you probably know that you have a good idea what you think an animal is, but we need a real specific definition because you'll see that some of the animals we deal with um, in, in the marine environment um, may not be what you're typically thinking an animal is like. Animals are multicellular. They are heterotrophic. That means they need to get their carbon and their energy source from consuming other organisms. They're not autotrophs. They're not producers. They are eukaryotic. Animals do not have a cell wall and most of them have a tissue level of organization. We'll explain that in a little bit, but not all of them. And most reproduce sexually with a dominant diploid stage. It has two sets of the genetic material we talked about before. And if we kind of go back to the cladogram we looked at before, and how we talked about the domain eukarya and where we talked about say the dinoflagellates and the diatoms and where they fit in on this bigger picture you can see uh, right here is where we have our uh, kingdom animalia and if we extend then that line we get sort of a cladogram another cladogram of the invertebrates that we'll talk about most of these will hit here i want to point out uh, something that I thought was kind of interesting that was out of the textbook and labeled as box 7.2 and mentioned the discovery of three new phyla. What I wanted to mention here was that when we talked about the marine environment and how we've only only explored 5% of the ocean. So what's interesting about this and you don't need to know these three organisms or the details of their life and that kind of thing, but what they mention here is what's interesting about the ocean is people discover new phyla, which remembers way up there. So kingdom phylum class, we're discovering not only new species, but, but whole new sort of groups of animals in the ocean. And that doesn't really happen on land. And, and I think that's kind of neat uh, to point out because there, there's still so much to discover in marine biology. So remember when we talk about um, most animals are going to have a tissue level of organization, but some of them will have a cellular level of organization. They're organized into individual cells, and that will be the first group that we talk about, uh, the sponges. And then all the others will have a tissue level of organization. A tissue on an organism or on an animal is a group of cells that work together to perform some kind of function. And the other thing that will be of importance here is what we call symmetry. And we'll see two kinds of symmetry in most of our animals, and we'll use these as a way to distinguish what group they're going to fit into. So the first is radial symmetry. Radial symmetry means it's like a wheel, and it means that you can cut an organism or you could slice it in many different directions where what you have on the right will still be like what you have on the left. So bilateral symmetry, which is like us, there's really only one plane that you can cut uh, an animal like a human right down the middle where you have a right and left. You can't. So radial symmetry is like a wheel. Like if you look at this pot here, you can cut the pot uh, one angle or another and you have a right and left that are basically the same. And bilateral symmetry, which is like us, or like the shovel, or like this lobster, there's really only one way you can cut it where you have a right and a left. All right, our first phylum that we're gonna talk about, remember we have kingdom, animalia, the phylum periphera is our first group, and this is the only animal that has a cellular level of organization. They're almost all entirely found in the ocean. There's some that are found in freshwater, ecosystems, but most of them are found in the ocean. There's around 9,000 species and only 100 are found in freshwater. They are asymmetrical, which means they don't really have any symmetry to them. Sometimes they do, sometimes they're radially 
symmetrical. The periphera are also hermaphrodites, which means that they have both male and female parts that are functioning. And sometimes people will incorrectly use the word hermaphrodites as applied to humans or other animals. But um, the, the distinction is, is that a true hermaphrodite, something that is really a hermaphrodite, has both functioning male and female parts. And that can't really happen in a human or most animals um, because the parts that develop into male are the same parts that would develop into a female based under different hormone controls and things like that. Some animals like sponges, they have both separate male and female functioning parts and can produce both sperm and eggs uh, in the same individual organism. So they're true hermaphrodites. And often they live in these groups and we call a group of sponges a sleaze. And the sponges, like I said, have this cellular level of organization. They have a couple of cells that are important that are worth mentioning. The most important, probably in terms of feeding first, is this thing called a coanocyte. And a coanocyte has this collared structure that sticks out and it has a flagella in the center. Many organisms have flagella and flagella at a cellular level is used for movement. So the coanocytes have this flagella and they beat that flagella to create uh, water currents that allow particles to move in and around the sponge and that's how they pick them up. And then the amoebocytes then are found uh, inside the sponge and the, what the amoebocytes do with the pseudopodia is they actually will engulf or eat food particles that are brought in by the coanocytes. All right, so the amoebocytes then help digest the food. Now, there's a couple little uh, interesting parts about a sponge we need to mention. First of all, the sponge, again, is sessile. It's sitting attached to a rock or that kind of thing, and water is moving into the sponge because of those coanocytes. Well, water enters the sponge through these little tiny holes that are on the side of the sponge called the ostia. And the water moves in, and then it goes out the top which is called the osculum. So all sponges have those ostia and then have that osculum where the water moves out of the top. And most sponges have then sharp, sometimes sharp rods um, that are made of either calcium carbonate or glass and they're called spicules. And the spicules are scattered throughout the sponge and give it three dimensional shape. And in addition to that, some sponges also have a protein called spongin, and the spongin also helps give certain sponges a three-dimensional shape. Sponges, again, are at this cellular level of organization such that if you take a sponge, run it across a grater, so you have a living sponge and you kind of shred it up into pieces, uh, and then you put it in salt water in a, like a petri dish with salt water, the cells will re-aggregate back into the sponge quite often. And in fact, it's kind of interesting. You can take two different species of sponge and you can kind of break them all apart, put them in seawater, and they will actually quite often separate into the two species that they are because the cells are able to sort of recognize one another. This is kind of a close up of some of the spicules and then the protein spongin as well. That makes up the skeleton of the sponge. It gives it some three-dimensional shape. And again, the spicules can be either calcium carbonate um, or they could be made out of silica. So there are several classes of sponges. And remember, we have our kingdom, Animalia, Phylum Periphera, and then class at the next level. So we're working through our taxonomic organization of how they fit onto the tree of life here. So the first class we'll do here is called class hexactinildidae, and I've had many years of practice saying it, so I'm able to do it, but it took me a while at first hexactinildidae, and the hexactinildidae class have silica spicules. They're often called the glass sponges because uh, when the organism dies, what's left is this intricate pattern of these glass spicules. And then uh, the other one we'll cover is the demospongia, silica spicules, or what's also common is that they don't have spicules, but instead they have this abundant protein scattered throughout called spongin. And if you look at this, this looks like 
a sponge. And in fact, um, the sponge that you use at your house, the, the green one and the yellow one, that's not this. That's a made up one. But if you, um, so we made that one out of cellulose. If you watch some, some of the older movies, you know, uh, Western movies and things like that, anytime someone's using a sponge or bathing, they used this kind of looking sponge. But that sponge is a real living, or was, a real living organism and it died and it's dried out and what's left is the spongin and that's where the original sponge came from. And then we've made artificial ones from plant materials based on that same model. Now, when we talk about animals, especially as we move uh, up into our next group, we need a little bit on development. So the first thing is if you take an egg, so an animal egg, not like a chicken egg, but like, let's say, uh, a human egg that's inside a potential mother. It is not diploid, but rather it is haploid, meaning it has only one set of chromosomes. The male will produce sperm, and when the sperm and the egg get together, they, during fertilization, they form this one cell that's called the zygote. Now, what happens is, you know, that one cell, that's one cell and it's a pretty big cell. And what happens is it's going to go through and it's going to divide. It's going to take all the information and it copy it and divide it up and divide it into two cells and then four cells and so forth. And along the way, those different cell stages have different names, marula, blastula, but you don't need to worry about those. As we continue on, if you imagine that as the cells keep dividing, there's a, there's a space on the inside, it's hollow. So it's like, a, it's like a balloon, let's say. So imagine you have a balloon and on the outside of the balloon, you have a whole bunch of cells and then it's, it's hollow on the inside. Now what I'm gonna do with my balloon, I'm gonna take my balloon and with my thumbs, I'm gonna push the balloon up inward like you see down here. And that stage is called the gastrula. And where I pushed my thumbs in, that first part is going to be called the blastopore, the opening to where I pushed my thumbs in when I made my gastrula. The outside is most likely going to develop in the, into the tissue called ectoderm, which will be skin and things like that. And the inside part is most likely going to be endoderm, which is a tissue that'll form the digestive system. So we'll start with that part right there.